now it actually gives me really great pleasure to introduce our international speaker, Dr. John Kluger who's, Kruger, who's come to join us for the couple of days from the United States um, and his capacity of the Health Institute of Healthcare Improvement. Um, he has a background in medication safety, reliability, public health and quality improvement and received his MD from the University of Oklahoma, um, completed his residency at John Peter Smith Family Practice and received his Master's in Public Health from the Harvard. He's currently working as a healthcare consultant and healthcare executive and has actually been heavily involved in opioid safety and patient and population safety interventions related to opioid, all things opioid, um, as well as developing integrated pain management programs. He was the 2010-11 George Merck Fellow at the Institute of Healthcare Improvement um, and has previously held positions as Vice President of Quality and Medical Director of Quality Management with integrated healthcare organisations in the States. So I'm sure that you'll join me in welcoming him. And at least it's stopped raining. That's all I can say. Thank you, John. It's so nice to meet John face to face because with the national team, we've been talking to him um, for the last two to three months on teleconferences and it's really difficult to engage when you can't see people. So yeah, so now hopefully we're giving you a great Kiwi welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. April, do we have a, uh, a mic by any chance? Okay, no worries. Well, thank you and I'd like to thank uh, New Zealand HQSC for uh, having me here to speak today and also to meet all of you. And I'd like to thank you uh, because um, like one of our previous speakers, I have a personal story with regards to opioids. Um, thank you. We'll do a quick mic check. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so I have, a, uh, I have a personal story with regards to opioids. I won't go too much into it, but how many people here have had a family member that's been affected by opioid safety? All right. How many people here have had a person they've known that's died due to opioids? Okay. Yeah, um, this is a real serious health issue in my country. Um, we, uh, we discovered several years ago that we were, uh, due to opioids, we were basically uh, uh, accidentally killing 16,000 people a year in the United States. So um, one of the issues with opioids, so that's, a, that's the mortality rate from opioids, obviously, but there's also a lot of other safety issues. Um, so unfortunately, uh, despite those statistics, um, there's not a lot of countrywide effort, uh, frankly, to improve this area of, of health harm. If you study your adverse drug events, what you'll notice is that you'll see that it's usually the warfarins and the anticoagulants that are always atop in the ADEs, right? Uh, but as you go down the list, then you get into the anti-glycemics and that sort of thing. And then always in the top three or four is opioids. And so I, I really applaud you all. Uh, I think of this as really pioneering work that you're doing. It's not easy. It feels a little like, what are we doing from time to time? Uh, and that's normal because no one else is doing it. And certainly no one else that I'm aware of has tackled this issue at a countrywide level. So something uh, that I think you should be very proud of. And uh, frankly, the learning that you're, you're going to do here is gonna help my patients in the United States. And it's gonna help a lot of other patients around the world. And so, uh, you know, like Margaret Mead said, don't ever uh, underestimate that a small group of determined people can change the world because it's the only thing that ever has. So uh, I really applaud you all for your work there. So I have a, I have a single goal, and that, that single goal is to uh, not put you to sleep today, because any time we talk about uh, things that involve measurement or math, well, uh, that tends to create a horror, horror, look of horror on the faces of the audience. But we're going to talk today about measurement for improvement. Uh, what are measures, data collection, baseline data, and also learn a little bit about some of the graphs that we use in improvement science. All right. 
I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Lloyd, uh, Robert Lloyd, uh, prior to this. A lot of the slides you see today, Bob is an uh, improvement advisor for IHI, teaches all around the world, so if you happen to run into him, uh, you can tell him that Dr. Kruger stole his, stole his slides. Um, but uh, Bob knows that. So um, our discussion topics for today, we're going to look at the model for improvement. We're going to look at the three types of measures. Uh, why do we use measurement and, uh, you know, uh, judgment, research, QI, and what are the, the various ways that, that those are uh, used and why are they important to understand which one you're in. Sampling for quality improvement. Uh, we're going to look at the aims of enumerative and analytic studies, um, how to establish a baseline, what a baseline really is, analysis of data using run charts, and analysis of data using control charts. And then, what are the rules for using these various types of charts? So, most of you all are familiar with the model for improvement, but essentially the model for improvement is really kind of an elegant little model. It asks three basic questions. It asks, what are we trying to accomplish? How will we know that a change is an improvement? And what change can we make that will, lead, that will result to an improvement? In a sense, what we're really doing is looking at the scientific method. And so it's a way, when you think about MFI, what you're really thinking about is a scientific method uh, to some extent. Where you ask a question, you do some background research, you construct a hypothesis, you test your hypothesis, you analyze your data, and you report your results. When I talk to doctors and when I talk to medical staff, uh, sometimes that, that doesn't really ring uh, true for them. So one of the things that, that we talk about is the medical model. So in the medical model, as a physician, I would collect signs and symptoms. I would develop a treatment plan and prescribe the plan and collect signs and symptoms to determine if there's an improvement. And that's really very similar to the model for improvement. So like, any, uh, like anything in improvement, we have different types of measures and different types of metrics. So one type of measure is a process measure. So process measures are measures that typically identify a step in a process. How many people here are measuring process measures within your, within your metrics? Yeah? Can you give me a couple examples of what you're, what you're measuring? What, what would be a process measure that you're measuring? Documentation. Documentation, okay. Anyone else? Okay. Um, basically, uh, so you can think of a process measure as uh, the things that, that lead to the outcome. It's not necessarily the outcome, and this gets a little challenging sometimes to get this at a conceptual view, but I have a couple examples on the next page. How about balancing measures? So balancing measures are really measures to assure that changes to improve one part of the system aren't causing problems in other parts of the system. So in my country, we had an issue with some balancing measures I was just talking to Carmela about. Uh, has anybody heard of the Joint Commission for accreditation? Okay. Well, we had a little thing came out that was pain as a fifth vital sign. So when we started uh, treating pain very aggressively with opioids, we forgot to ask, well, what happens, what are some of the things we should have thought about, perhaps, such as opioid-induced respiratory depression or constipation or some of these other sort of things. So in that sense, and the reason that that, that this might sound confusing to some folks, sometimes a balancing, the balancing measure is really determined from what you're actually measuring as your key outcome, okay? So that's a concept that you have to keep in mind. So what might be a balancing measure in one hand might, on the other hand, be a process or an outcome measure on the other hand. Does that make sense? So it really depends on what is your primary goal of what you're trying to measure is what the, what the balancing measure is. Uh, how about outcome measures? Outcome measures are generally easy to describe, uh, but, and we usually see them by the primary aim. So if you look at your primary aim, that's going to be uh, generally your outcome measure. And so just a little bit more. So again, the outcome measure is usually the voice of the customer or the patient, how the system is performing, what's the result. Process measures the voice of the workings of the system. Are the steps in the process working? Are all the things that lead up to the outcome measure working? Then the balancing measure are looking for those things that maybe we should think about. What are, the, what are the unforeseen consequences if we head down path A or path B and really go after and try to improve that? 
So here's kind of an example using opioid-induced constipation prevention and treatment. So um, if the topic is prevention and appropriate treatment of constipation in patients taking opioids, one outcome measure might be the total number of days from mission until the first bowel movement. Okay. Uh, another one might be patient satisfaction scores with pain and constipation. Process measure might be the percent opioid patients prescribe stool softeners and laxatives. Again, leading possibly to your outcome measure. Percent of patients receiving constipation education, percent of patients with a bowel hygiene regimen prescribed. Then balancing measures might be the total volume of opioids prescribed, the average length of stay, pain control reported by the patient, average daily cost of care. How many people look at cost? Is cost important to your health system? Yeah. It is in the US too. It's, <laughs> it's usually uh, where we start sometimes. I don't advise it, by the way. Uh, so why are we measuring? So there's really three, three reasons why we measure. Research, improvement, and judgment. And which one you choose to measure actually determines out where you're going to end up on your journey. Um, so what's interesting about it, measuring for improvement is that the aim with improvement is improvement of care efficiency, effectiveness, et cetera. If you're me measuring for accountability, you're measuring generally to compare um, for reassurance, for motivation for change. In research, you're looking for new knowledge. So you might know where you are by looking at some of the, the methods. So with improvement, the test is observable. With accountability, there's no test. You just evaluate the current performance. So, and in research, we blind the test, typically, or we can at least try to control it. In improvement science, we set bias. It's part of who we are. We just accept that it's there, and we accept that it's consistent. Um, accountability, we measure and adjust to reduce bias. And with research, we design to eliminate bias. In sample size, and this is really important, with improvement, Oops, pardon me. We are uh, mainly interested in just enough data, very small sequential samples. And we'll talk about that when we go into PDSA testing and why that's so important. Um, and accountability, we want 100% of all the available data, usually. And in research, we collect data on everything we can get our hands on. We want to know every fact, variable, nuance, et cetera, um, about that. Our hypothesis is very flexible in improvement science. In accountability, we don't even have a hypothesis. And just do it because we said, we said to do it usually. And with research, we fix the hypothesis. We have uh, the prevailing hypothesis, and then we have the null hypothesis. Our testing strategy and improvement is sequential test. In accountability, we don't test. And uh, typically in research, we have one large test. And if we're wrong, well, we publish our results and say we learned or we didn't learn. For improvement, we use run charts or shoe heart control charts, which I'll discuss in, in a moment. In accountability, we don't really usually uh, use these type of charts. Um, I have, there's a joke in accountability, we tend to use pie charts and bar charts, but that's an that's a improvement science goal, so, uh, improvement science joke, so uh, if, you have, if, you're, if you catch the joke, that's, uh, that's what we joke about sometimes. We have a horrible sense of humor. Um, so. Uh, um, and then in research, hypothesis and t statistical tests, so t-test and f-test and chi-square and p-values and those sort of things. The confidentiality of the data, the data is only used by those involved with improvement, and that's a really big point. So if you're, you know, one of the things we get to do with improvement science is uh, a lot of times we have a lot more freedom in the ways we can test uh, than with research. All right. So this, you can view the three uh, phases of improvement or performance improvement as silos. But in reality, it's more like a Rubik's Cube. I'll kind of explain. So you have a Rubik's Cube. Um, you know, you can't really move one side without affecting the other side. 
And that's essentially what's going on with these three phases of improvement. There's not one that's better or worse. They all have specific purposes. But the real focus of, because we're here for improvement science predominantly, the real uh, focus of improvement science is always on the future. That's what we're trying to improve. We're, we're envisioning a future that's, that's different from what we have now. Again, the three approaches to research. So research for efficacy, and this is something that I talk to docs a lot about, uh, that is really different about improvement science. How many people worked in a factory? Okay. So um, when I used to work in a factory, I, I had an industrial background before I got into medicine. We made pipe. Um, you know, I didn't run a large quality uh, test a lot of times. Once I, had, once I had a product, I didn't wake up every morning and say, gee whiz, you know, I'm going to go out and I'm going to hypothesis test my pipe. Uh, you know, what I was re really interested in, I knew I had a good product. What I wanted to do is create a, uh, I wanted to get that product out the door uh, and m make sure it made spec and make sure I, uh, you know, stay within cost and the quality was high and we didn't scrap a lot of pipe. Uh, quality improvement research is really aimed at efficiency and effectiveness. So, uh, and what's interesting about quality improvement science is we accept that what works in your system may not work in another system. So the model for improvement, what are we trying to accomplish? How we know the changes in improvement? And what change can we make that will result in improvement followed by PDSA cycles? When you combine the three questions with the PDSA cycle, that is the model for improvement. And this is where we're gonna to focus today. The three questions really compose a strategy, and the PDSA cycle provides a tactical approach. So it's a tool, essentially, a tactical tool that you use uh, to accomplish the work to lead to improvement. So I'm gonna talk real briefly about sampling. Uh, you can see the pink circles. Um, uh, and sampling is really, uh, uh, switching gears a little bit, but sampling is really when you can't gather data on the entire population. So this is, and this is a vexing problem, and there's lots and lots, and there is, I'm gonna start off with a caveat. There's not a right, right way or a wrong way to sample. There's not uh, necessarily always an appropriate sample size. It, and I'm gonna use my statistical hat and I'm gonna say, if you wanna know how much, how much data should you collect, well, it depends. And it really does depend. But I'll take you through a couple scenarios and kind of explain how, this, how, how we use uh, sampling um, in, in improvement science. So this is a traditional bell curve. I'm sure everyone has seen one of these before in their life, at least once or twice. And if you, had a, if you wanted a good sample from a bell curve, how would you do it? So anyone have an idea of how you'd, how you'd take a good sample from a population? What would be a good sample? For example, would I go over here, pull one out of here? What if I went right over here? Well, what if I just always pulled them right out of the middle? Well, so a representative sample has the same shape and location as the total population. Um, and randomization in this, this uh, for sampling is really key in this, in, when you're in classical statistics. So, you know, what we try to do is we try to randomly sample within the whole population. And we want every person in that population or every element in that population to have the exact same chance of being sampled. So that's, that's random sampling. Remember when we were looking at improvement science, we accept bias, right? So a bias sample, a negatively biased sample would be all the way over here at the left-hand side, and a positively biased sample would be all the way, uh, or pardon me, over at the right-hand side, and a positively biased sample would be all the way over at the left. And if you pull a sample improperly, you could get some form of bias. The difference really with improvement science though is we're really talking about two different kinds of studies. And Dr. Deming, if you've ever read uh, some, of his, uh, some of his books and some of his studies, he distinguished between these two types of, science, two types of uh, studies. And he called them enumerative studies and analytical studies. And he said 
the author, speaking of himself, distinguishes between enumerative studies and analytical studies. An enumerative study has for its aim an estimate of the number of units of a frame that belong to a specified class. An analytic study has for its aim a basis for action on the cause system or the process in order to improve the product of the future. So remember, in improvement science, we're concerned about the future. And we also know that we can't control our environment many times. So in an enumerative study, this is a pond. And so what I would do if I were going to sample from a pond, that water's pretty still. It doesn't change. Yeah, it might be a little different around the periphery. But if I were going to take samples, let's say I wanted to collect five samples from the pond and compare the water maybe for the amoebic concentration in each sample, it would be a good thing to do with pond water, I guess. Um, you know, you could pick five random samples out of that pond uh, anywhere, pretty much, and you probably come up with about the same concentration of that. So that's, that is um, an enumerative study. An analytic study is where we live with improvement science, so. So how many people every day have the same exact number of patients in your hospital, exactly the same as the other patients, and that you have blocked off, you made sure that they meet all the criteria for your studies, how many people have that in their day-to-day -day life? How many times can you go in and control the environment, just like you read in your research paper, for why you prescribe drug A over drug B? How many times can you go into your current practice and control all those variables that they controlled for in that research study? Does that ever happen? No. Nah. No. Quality improvement is messy. We live in the real world. We live in the real world and it's like this stream and we're sampling out of the stream and that's really, really difficult work. Um, and so we have, what we're interested in is this. We're interested in generalizability. You know, if you sample an enumerative study, you really wanna know the variability, the position, and the statistical level of confidence. And so, uh, kind of example, let's say you were in a, you wanted to see if, uh, in a population of male children between the age of five and six living in a rural setting, if their heights differed from those children of the same age living in the city. So if you put all these three variables in, I can pull out that it's gonna take me 245 children to get a good sample size uh, based, on, based on that, with a 95% confidence interval and a 5% error rate. You don't really have that when you're doing improvement science, so. so you do have some options, though. I mean, I don't know about you, but is anybody pulling 245 samples on a daily basis? <laughs> so it's not. And I'll explain in a moment. You'll start to see in a moment why you don't need that many samples. Because again, they got one shot many times in these. When you're doing an enumerative study, you have one shot, especially if you're doing data for research. The analytical study, Keep in mind, we're always interested in the future. So we're trying, the whole purpose of collecting data is we're gonna to try to predict what's gonna happen next. So simple random sampling, that's a very common way to do it. So you just basically flip a coin or you, you reach into a bag and you say, I'm gonna pick number seven, number eight, and number 10, and you go and you sample randomly from the population. It's a very acceptable way to sample. You can do stratified proportional random, random sampling. You say, look, I know where the OIC cases are in my hospital. They're in my surgical wards. I'm only gonna, sur I'm only gonna sample surgical patients and I'm gonna go after that. And that actually combined a little bit of something else that we call judgment sampling. Now, if you did judgment sampling in a, in a enumerative type research project, you would probably be uh, thrown out of the university. They would say, that, that's heretical. But in improvement science, we allow it. In fact, we encourage it. And the reason we encourage it is it allows us to get to the answer that we're trying to figure out and hopefully um, uh, rapidly test our hypothesis. So judgment sampling is very, very important for PDSA testing. I mean, again, I'm not trying to prove uh, necessarily um, that this is uh, ubiquitous to all, uh, to all scenarios. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to understand 
the population and, and the system in which I'm working. And I'm trying to find out a way to test that very efficiently. And that's why you use judgment sampling. So, and typically we use um, success of small samples instead of one large sample. So I'll give you an example of judgment sampling. So um, here's a nurse, she says, we never use naloxone on this ward because we don't have any events. She's judgment sampling in essence. She's basically saying, look, I don't think it'd be worth our while to go after naloxone uh, to see if we use naloxone on this ward, we never use it. I've got it, look, I've checked, we don't have anything. Uh, a doctor, he says, I know my patients don't have any safety issues with opioids. In essence, he's really judgment sampling. May not be the right judgment, but he's judgment sampling, for lack of a better word. And again, and here's a uh, war clerk, and he says, we seem to use naloxone a lot in the recovery unit. Let's try sampling there. So um, again, what each one of these folks are doing is essentially they're using their internal judgment of where they see events occurring to decide where they want to start testing so that they can, they can get uh, they, can, they may actually be able to see a change in their data. So moving along, I'm gonna talk just briefly about baseline data because I know this is a, a series of angst for many people. So how many data points do you need to have a good baseline? Anybody have an idea about how many data points it takes to have a good baseline? How many? Five? Any other takers? Minimum of 10, okay. What's Anyone else? You, sir. How many data points? Not to put you on the spot. 15, very good. You're all correct. Absolutely correct. And again, it depends. And so I want to suggest that if you don't have a ton of data points, we have a lot of tricks up our sleeves in, in QI. So we can actually help out with that. Uh, if you collect one data point, you probably need a few more than that. But One's probably too few, but uh, the more you have, the many times the better. Sometimes it can cause some, uh, some issues. Uh, typically, typically, the party line is between eight and 12 for a baseline. Um, but do you need eight to 12? Not necessarily. It really depends. Sometimes it's very hard to get baseline data. Uh, and so the most important thing is that you collect data. Because without data, we have no ability to even guess at what the baseline is. So if you can collect more data points, that's great for baseline. But if you can't, no big deal. Uh, we have, like I said, we have lots of little tricks we can use to extend your baseline and things like that. A couple things you do need for a baseline is you do need a name. You need to understand that your data doesn't have to be perfect to start. One of the things that made me so happy today is that I saw Teams, and I started asking them, tell me about when you started collecting data. And they went from retrospective to prospective, you know? And the data isn't perfect when they start, but they can tell me what happened. They can go back and look at that data over time and they can show me the story. This data all tells a story. It tells a story of what you learned. It tells a story of, of what you're doing. It tells a story of what you're testing. And so it really is more of a story over time uh, that's played out uh, with some math involved. So, if we look at a quality measurement journey, it looks something like this. So you have to have an aim. So let's say our aim is reduced opioid induced res respiratory depression by 90% in six months. What's our concept? And we'll talk more about driver diagrams and how they help us get a, concept, a conceptual framework for some of the changes we wanna, wanna have happen or what's driving our uh, things that drive our aim. So it's reduced harm caused by opioids with respect to respiratory depression. What's our measure? Naloxone doses, number? We may have two measures. Number of identified cases of opioid-induced respiratory depression per 1,000 inpatient days. What are our operational definitions? Again, we, what's our data collection plan? Who's collecting the data? And then what's our analysis? And that's where we use a run and control chart. And then our test of change against that data to really see how are we are the things that we think will change or lead to a future improvement, um, are they working? So now we're gonna play a little game. All right, I just collected a data point. Where's the next dot gonna be? Up or down? Oh. So 
So one of the things in, one of the things, uh, like I said, if you, have, if, you, if you can get to 12 data points, is a great place to start for baseline. And I put that up there just as a, as a guideline. But the point is, is that what you'll typically see with a, with a baseline, if you've made no changes on the system, um, your data is going to kind of follow some sort of ran random pattern, if you will. Um, so this data, really what you can predict is that you would kind of expect that the dots going forward would basically stay in that same band. If you make no changes on the system, it's going to stay the same, right? So the way we display our data is really, really important. I'll kind of give you a couple illustrated. I'll, I'll illustrate about, remember we were talking about data for improvement, data for research, data for judgment? So you have a lot of choices. How many people have seen red, yellow, green charts? Do you have red, yellow, green charts in your, in your country? Yeah? Okay. U.S. loves red, yellow, green charts. We're going to hold everybody accountable. Okay. Well, are they getting better? Can you tell? Does it look like they're getting better? I don't know. How about that data? So... There's data for improvement up on the top, and there's data for judgment down at the bottom. See how the one looks like it's a pretty stable system. Data points are all kind of hovering around a central line, so eh, maybe getting better, maybe getting worse. Really hard to tell, but. So how many people like bar charts? So if we look at bar charts, I get these about once a week in my department uh, where somebody will come in and say, okay, hey, we, uh, congratulations, we just dropped from 5 to 4%. Wow, that's pretty amazing. 20% drop in overall mortality. Well, how'd you do that? Well, we implemented a protocol. Well, yep. Yeah. That tells a little bit different story, doesn't it? You see how that tells a different story about, and that's really what an improvement. Again, we're interested in the future. That's the difference. Uh, if you're collecting data for, for, an for a enumerative study, what you're typically interested in is testing under condition. You're not necessarily interested in the future, not interested, necessarily interested is it generalizable to, to this specific area, my specific ward, my, my specific population. Which is one of the reasons that we struggle. Enumerative studies are, are great. They are. I've done quite a few of them. But uh, they have a very specific purpose, and that's new knowledge. Uh, the specific purpose here is actually improvement. So when we're collecting data for improvement, we need several things. I need an X and a Y uh, line, and I also need a point of central tendency. So uh, measure of central tendency. So, um, and that, that point of central tendency is really important because it changes between run and control charts. What we'll talk about is how in, with run charts, we actually use a median. And with control charts, we use a mean as our point of central tendency. This was, I can remember when I started off in improvement science that this wasn't always intuitive to me. But again, if you're collecting, remember you're sampling out of a population, right? Let's say you picked five samples. So you're basically taking your point of central tendency out of, that, out of those five samples. So this is your static view of your data. And this is really what you're doing. Does that make better sense now about, about the way you're collecting data? And every data point you put up is basically where your distribution lies. And your point of central tendency is either your median or mean, and you're showing data over time. What we're looking for with data over time is two very specific things. One, I'm trying to predict the future again. That's, that's what I want to do. I want to know if the change that I implemented is going to lead to an improvement. And the, what I'm trying to understand is, is my data stable? Is my process stable? We call that controlled variation. Uh, or uh, what we often refer to as common cause variation. Um, and or is it unstable, which is its special cause variation? So here's kind of an example 
of clinical process, take your pick, it can be anything. And you have random variation there in the middle, and then you have kind of an assignable special cause. So something changed. Don't know what it was, was it good, bad? This graph doesn't, doesn't attempt to go into that. But something changed that made our data unstable. Maybe, maybe we want it to be unstable. Uh, improvement science is about trying to, in many cases, destabilize the norm. <laughs> Shake things up a bit. So uh, our first speaker today, we heard him say about being a little bit of a provocateur within your organization. So that's what improvement science does. So common cause variation, and this is really the two types of variation. Common cause is inherent in the design of the process. It is, it is the million things that feed into your day-to-day -day process uh, that why you have your outcomes, et cetera. Uh, it, 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 there's a thousand things, at least, that go into it and more. It's due to regular, natural, or ordinary causes. It affects all outcomes of a process. It results in a stable process that is predictable. In other words, remember how we were looking at the baseline? pretty much know where my next data point's gonna go uh, unless something changes on the system. It's, the process is stable. I, can, I have some degree of belief or predictability about the future. It's also known as random or unassignable variation or common cause variation. Special cause variation is due to irregular or unnatural causes that are not inherent in the design of the process. Something acted on the system. Good, bad, indifferent, Fluke, those happen too. Affects some, but not necessarily all aspects of the process. It results in an unstable process that is not predictable. It's also known as non-random or assignable variation. So this is something that looks pretty familiar probably to most healthcare people. So a good way to help folks understand common cause and special cause variation. Common cause variation is your heart rate. Um, now, uh, you know, it's pretty predictable, uh, but not, the last beat might not be the same as, the, as uh, the next beat, but it stays within a range, right? But um, if I had you jog around the block, you'd probably have a special cause. Your heart rate would increase. How many people would be able to identify what the special cause was? Probably about 100%, because we anticipate that would happen. That's a physiologic response uh, to, um, to exercise. So same thing with atrial flutter. So you can kind of see that all of a sudden the heart rate goes up, the monitors start going off, they're detecting a special cause in essence. So our elements of a run chart, again, we have a measure. We have time, typically. And on the center line, we have the median. And that is what we use for our measure of central tendency. And you can use four simple rules when you're looking at run charts. I'm gonna go over these real quickly. So you don't have to write them down. Um, and I have lots of cheat sheets for you guys, so you can take them home and look at your data and See if you have a special cause or a common cause variation in your data. Or, um, so a run. So first thing, um, how many people know what a run is already? Do you already, already encountered this kind of language? Okay, great. Um, so it's one or more consecutive data points on the same side of the median constitutes a run. We call that, that's how the term run chart actually came out. Uh, when Shuart was describing how he used uh, graphical displays of data, he was basically, came up, they, they, they talked about different things, and what they observed is that the data seemed to be running together, so they called it a run chart. <laughs> data points that ran together were called a run chart. We don't include the data points that fall in the median, and uh, you can actually count up the number of runs you have. So if I were to ask you to count the number of runs. I'm gonna show you the, so it's all the data points, wherever you have a data point on the side of the median. I'll see if I can do that. So there would be a run, 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 whoops, there's a big run, 
there would be a run. Don't count that. There would be a run. Another run. Another run. We didn't count that one because it's on the median. Another run. Another run. Another run. Another run. Another run. Another run. So if you count those all up, how many runs do you count? Any ideas? It's okay. How many? Very close. So there's actually 14 runs. I'm going to show you an easier way than what I just showed you to count these. This always tricks me up, though, so you can hold me, uh, you can hold me, keep me honest. What you want to count is actually the number of times that the line crosses over, okay? If you just count the crosses, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, plus 1. Count the number of times it cr crosses plus 1, you get your number of runs. And the reason that's important will be evident in just a moment, because this is actually one of the important run rules that we have when we're trying to interpret data. Real quick caveat about run chart rules. You will see differences in the literature, and you will see some uh, academic disagreements over, over the rules. So. Uh, if somebody says, for example, well, I don't believe, you know, uh, there, there's not so much disagreement with run chart rules, there's more with control chart rules. Um, and so what you see here today is the opinion of a certain body of experts who believe in these rules. Um, there's another body of experts that says, look, uh, I think it's one less data point and that counts as run chart rules, but they're based essentially on um, three standard deviation rules is what we base. We, we base the control chart rules on. The run chart rules are essentially based um, on some statistical significance that I'll show you in just a moment. So a rule number one is a shift in the process or too many data points in a run. So that's six or more consecutive points above or below the median. So if we go back, does anybody see six where rule one might fall in. Do we have, does rule one hold for any of these data points? So let's count our points below the median. So here you have one, two, three, four, five, six. That would be, we would have a special cause according to rule one, okay? How about up here? One, two, three, four, five. Up. Oh. If it lands on the median, you can't count it. That's, that's the caveat to that. That's the Rule number two, trend. Five or more consecutive points, all increasing or decreasing. So, do we have any five points going down or going up? I don't see very much in that data mix. So I don't think rule two applies to this data. How about rule three? Too many or too few runs, we'll show you that in a minute. Uh, and rule number four is an astronomical data point. Anybody see any astronomical data points? How about that one might be. That one might be. Again, you've got to use a little judgment with astronomical data points. So if you have an astronomical data point with a run chart and you don't know what happened, maybe you need to go back and check your data again. Um, usually with special causes, people know what happened. Uh, with common cause, people will have a lot of explanations, a lot of theories about what's going on in the data, and that's really important because with special cause, if your data goes from zero to 100 all of a sudden, everybody's going to know what you did. Oh, we put Kiwi Crush on the plate. You know, whammo, it worked. Just like, we, just like our theory that Kiwi Crush would work, which I just learned what Kiwi Crush is, and I think that's just the coolest name, so... <laughs> I'm actually going to get me a little jar and take it home. <laughs> so, <laughs> just because it's cool. So, it's great. Maybe a new import product for you guys, you know? I'm just thinking. <laughs> um, so, again, this is just a, a rehash of the run chart rules. There are a few other run chart rules that I don't go into here because, frankly, they're a little, um, you don't see them very often. I would stick with these, but you will see other publications out there, and I want to acknowledge that, that, that there is a little discrepancy at times. All right. How many people have seen these? <laughs> 
My plea for you all is to please turn off your auto trend in Excel. Um, it, it tends to deceive the eye and it's not very accurate. Um, it's not truly a statistical trend. Uh, this is not a trend. Does, I mean, they have, there's three data points here and a line going down. So, um, but this tends to deceive uh, what's really happening and it, it really, it, it really doesn't, sometimes it's confused with the median and that can be, that can be kind of difficult. So rule number three, how many runs should we expect if the values all come from a stable process? So to do this, what you have to do is you have to look at the number of useful observations, you have to look at the number of runs, uh, the lower uh, level, the lower number of runs and the upper number of runs. So, so essentially what we would do, remember we counted 14? So rule number three, I have to go back and I have to count all my data points. So let me go back to that chart real quick. So I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. I might have missed one there. So I had 29 observations and the lower number of runs I would have expected would have been 10, and the top I would have expected would have been 20. So if you're outside those perimeters and you have to find this from a data chart, which we can provide you with, um, the other important thing is that that's really not true because you have to go back and you have to take out those two median points so they don't count. Um, so you go back and you, you go to 27. So we'd expect between 10 and 19 runs. We had 14 runs, remember? So uh, basically, that, that rule didn't, was not met. I included this slide just so that if you wanted to find a source for this, uh, you can look it up on, online, uh, but we can always provide you with that, with these data tables as well. All right, so now on to uh, an astronomical data point. So what about this data point? Is it astronomical? Probably. How about now? So this is actually a control chart. So uh, we can see an upper control limit and a lower control limit. So that's pretty easy to see in an eye chart. Um, you know, but it's not, the point, of the, the point of these two slides is that astronomical data points are subjective. You ought to have a story. It ought to, it ought to be reflected in the story about your data, and, and someone ought to know, hey, something happened here. If it just shows up randomly, go back and look at your data a couple times and just say, just make sure that it's not some collection error or a transposition of a number or something like that. This is something I get asked a lot. So p-value calculations. How many people love p-values? How many people work with doctors who love p-values? How many people get asked all the time about this quality improvement stuff and it doesn't matter because where's your p-value? Oh, I get asked that all the time. I love that question. So, remember that shift that we were talking about? So how many data points do you have to have to get to a p-value of 0 0.05? Actually only need five points above or below the median to get to a p-value of 0 0.05 significance. I actually get a little bit better than that. I get to 0 0.025. So, take that Mr. 0 0.05 significance. <laughs> Uh, how does this work? Well, am I flipping a coin? What's the chance it's going to add, that it's going to land on heads or tails? What's my chance? Right. Flip it again. What's the chance I'm going to land on heads twice? Yeah. But now, how many times, how likely is it it's going to land on heads twice in a row? 25, right? How about three times? 0.125, right? See, I'm already at, something special is happening now. If I, can, if I can land it on heads three times in a row, that means that should only happen, statistically speaking, 12.5 times out of 100. 
Yeah. It's probability theory, essentially. This is, this is, this is like 101 probability. If you, if you ever want to, so please take this slide home with you. And like if your docs start talking to you about p-values, I'm a doctor. I, I love p-values myself. But, you know, all a p-value is really saying is that, well, um, you know, p-value of 0.05 is really saying that, you know, I'm just, I'm sure that, uh, I'm 95% sure this isn't just due to chance alone. So. So we use control charts over run charts. I'm going to kind of speed this up, but essentially when you want to shift to a control chart is when you really have generally collected a, a, enough data, but actually you may not be seeing the, the test of change that you thought you would with a, with a run chart. And so you want a, a little bit more precision. It can also be used when you have a well-defined process and you're actually trying to figure out how to keep it in control because, again, we live in the messy world of the stream and very, it's very hard to control those elements that are going on in your health system. So if you want to try to keep it, not only just improve it, but you want to keep it from running off the rails for whatever reason, uh, that's when you want to run to a control chart. And in a control chart, again, we have our measurement, we have our time, and we have now, as our measure of central tendency, we use a mean or an average, basically. We also get upper control limits. And you'll notice that we have three upper and, and three lower control limits, in essence. And those all correspond, I'll go back to that in just a minute. Those all correspond to one, two, and three sigma limits, both positive and negative. Kind of makes sense? And do we have a special cause? So again, same thing with common cause variation and special cause variation. Again, it's process stable or unstable. So rule number one is a little different here, but this is our astronomical data point that we saw earlier, where with a run chart, sometimes eh, it's subject to opinion, but with control charts, we can actually be really pretty precise about, about this rule. Rule number two, now you need eight successive consecutive points above or below the center line. The same rules apply. You can't, a point on the center line doesn't count for or against. Um, uh, but uh, you, need, you need eight above or below. You need six or more consecutive points steadily increasing or decreasing. Two out of three successive points in zone A or beyond. I'll show you that in a minute and 15 consecutive points in zone C on either side of the center line. So it goes CBA, <laughs> so it's a little backwards from how most people think, but um, yeah. So here's your, again, astronomical data point. Again, it's above the upper control limit. Um, here's our eight or more, which would constitute what we would call a, a shift with run charts. Here's our trend, um, trend up and trend down, you need six. Two out of three consecutive points near a control limit. So notice we have one, two, three. So one, two, three. So again, because our, our successive points were due to, were two out of three were close to control limit, they can be close to the same control limit or they can be on direct opposite poles of control limit. Those are all special causes with control charts. And then 15 consecutive data points close to the center line in the inner one third. There are a few, uh, there are a few things we have to talk about when it comes to special cause rules. Rule number one, point exactly on a control limit is not considered outside the limit. So when there is not a lower or upper control limit, you can't apply rule one. Rule number two, point exactly on the center line does not cancel or count towards a shift. So you'll see that kind of as a common, common theme with, with run and control charts. Again, with control charts, uh, ties between two consecutive points. So if you have the exact same point following the other one, it doesn't cancel and it doesn't add to a trend. So you can still count your trend, you just have to carry it out a little bit further. And then two out of three successive points in zone A or below, Beyond, when there's not a lower upper control limit, rule four does not apply to the side missing limit. So 15 consecutive points in zone C, we call this hugging the center line. 
So I always thought that was a little bit funny personally. Anybody see the special cause here? About right there. See, astronomical data point, we're, we're right above the, the upper control limit. So this is a way, <clears throat> one of the things, most, most of the time when I teach improvement science, I'm actually talking to leadership in a hospital or in a health system to try to help them understand how to look at their data. Um, a, lot of my, a lot of my work that I've worked with is on um, building quality, uh, quality improvement systems, but also building quality control systems, um, much like you would have in a plant. Uh, so if you're working in a, in, a, you know, in a pipe plant or you're working in a chemical plant or something like that, when I worked in the plant, I would go in every morning and we'd look at our gauges, you know, and all I wanted to know, I'd be like, uh, you know, you go through. Doctors do this, anesthesiologists do this all the time. You know, they don't care about the ding or the beep, you know, they really just, uh, unless, uh, some, some of the time that's just noise in the background. They want to see is the process stable, is my patient stable, is everything going along the way I thought it was. What, they really want, what they're really looking for is those special causes that might be coming up. Some are real obvious, uh, some aren't so obvious. Unfortunately, we can make errors, um, and this doesn't really apply to, to the work we're doing here so much at this point in time. But I do want to put out a caution, and that is that if we see uh, common cause variation, the right choice is to change the process. Common cause variation is a signal that your process is stable. If you want it to change, you have to innovate. That's the only way to get out of it. And that's why you have to use PDSA cycles. That's why you gotta use driver diagrams, all those sort of things. They're just tools to help you innovate and find, and find a solution uh, to, your to your process problem. The wrong choice is when maybe we have common cause variation. And this happens a lot of times with data for uh, judgment. So when people say red, yellow, green in particular, they'll make a change and they'll say, go do X, Y, Z, and it'll change, you know, and then all of a sudden you look down and the thing got worse because we weren't looking at data over time. So be careful um, when you make changes to, to your process. Uh, one of the reasons we do PDSAs is so we have a his historical track of all the changes we made over time, so that if our data starts heading the wrong way from what we predicted it would, what our prediction was with a PDSA cycle or with, uh, with data over time, that we can go back and say, well, what went wrong? What, what, what did we change in this process? So it's, it's, a, it's basically a his, the historical archives of all the changes you made in the process. And actually, if you make, a lot, if you make the wrong choice, you tend to get increased variation. Your data points might go start getting widely dispersed. If you have special cause variation, you need to investigate the origin of the special cause. What I normally find with staff is that most staff can tell you when a special cause is occurring in the hospital. They'll absolutely be able to point back to, we did this and this happened. Um, it's not, not hard and fast, but it's, it's most of the time that's the case. Again, the wrong choice when you have a special cause can be to change the process. So if you know what the cause was and you just go in and blow up the entire process and maybe it was a, something you wanted. So we see this a lot. Um, we see it a lot in, uh, in metrics, in, in healthcare quality metrics where all of a sudden a metric will change and it's because, uh, oh, well, all the staff were out <laughs> or we lost half of our nursing service. Special cause, data went crazy. Everybody, the, the light turned red. Everybody in management started, I work in management, by the way, so I'm going to take my liberties with making fun of myself. But uh, uh, everybody starts running and tampering with everything and coming up with a thousand solutions. We're basically throwing PDSA cycles without even going through the process of doing a PDSA cycle at the problem. Um, this is the, that's why we, we have a rather rigorous process for going about improvement science is that um, what I will, the hardest part that we face in improvement science is actually correctly identifying the problem we're trying to solve. It's really actually that aim statement that's so important and so critical, um, and actually it's scoping out what is the problem we're actually trying to solve here. And then when that happens, you get some wasted resources. So again, our quality measurement journey is 
a good aim, how much by when. The concept, we'll find that in the, in the driver diagrams. Our measurement, we've learned a little bit about measurement today and some of the different types of measurement, why we measure, is this a balancing process or, uh, uh, or a control um, or, or an outcome measure, rather. Uh, our operational definitions, those are things that we'll work on. So this is basically tightening up our measures and, and uh, defining what our measures are actually gonna apply to. Our data collection plan, who, what, when, how, why. Um, who does it when that person's sick. <laughs> and then um, our data co collection and analysis using our run charts and control charts. So uh, any questions?